Hello, everyone, and welcome to my show, Let's Talk About It with Sabia Katoon here on VOD Talk. I hope everyone are keeping well and, um, you know, we are all doing our best to um, get on with our daily um, lives and, um, you know, let's just uh, make the most of it and be as positive as we can. I have a very, very important topic today with a few wonderful guests. Um, it's one of those conditions which I uh, believe is characterized by your emotional, your physical exhaustion. And it can lead to a diminished ability to empathize or feel compassion for others. It's often described as a negative cost of caring. And sometimes it's referred to as secondary traumatic stress. I will now take you over to my guests who are um, both um, have a, a background of a clinical um, psychiatrist and clinical psychologist. So if I can take you both, uh, all our viewers, over to our uh, wonderful guests, I have with me today Humaira Kutub, who is a clinical psychiatrist um, from Pakistan. So welcome, Humaira. I know you've been on my show before. Um, it's really good to see you again. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, on this lovely show. Brilliant. Thank you for joining us. And I know we've got a lot of important things that um, you will be sharing us on a professional level. If I can take you over to my next guest, her name is um, Tuba Arshad, and she's an associate clinical psychologist also from Pakistan. Um, so welcome, Tuba. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Brilliant. Brilliant. So basically, ladies, um, I know uh, this topic that we are going to um, give an overview and have a little discussion about is one that is actually when I looked into it it's very very familiar to what we feel every day um, and I, I believe it's not only in the healthcare I mean I can relate to a lot of uh, you know organizations uh, about this compassion fatigue um but today um i you know uh, i'm very very interested and i'm sure our viewers will be to find out you know what is compassion fatigue and also um what kind of um effects it can have on people and can we really overcome some of these um you know uh situations which you will be sharing with with us um you know as as we um, discuss. So um, I think if I ask um, Humaira, you know, could you give us an overview about what is compassion fatigue and why have you chosen the healthcare? All right. Um, thank you so much again for talking, for inviting me on this lovely show and uh, talking about such an important topic. So uh, when we talk about compassion fatigue, generally we refer to compassion fatigue as something which is, uh, you know, something experienced by healthcare workers or people who, you know, they are uh, caretakers for, with, for uh, with the ones who are suffering from any kind of traumatic events. So what happened generally is that people uh, who had been through any traumatic events and the ones who are taking care of them, so they vicariously get affected um, in the process of helping such people. Um, and as a result of it, so initially what happens is that they're quite enthusiastic, you know, um, for helping such people who have been through so any sort of traumatic event. But as they are helping them in this process, it starts taking a toll on their physical health as well as mental health. And as I specified that uh, a caretaker um, may experience compassion fatigue and a healthcare uh, worker, whether it's a nurse, a psychologist or a doctor, anyone who is working um, in a role of a healthcare worker may experience it and um, the more important thing the most important thing when we talk about compassion fatigue is to understand that sometimes people they use the word compassion fatigue uh, or the these two terms burnout and comp uh, compassion fatigue interchangeably however right. in compassion fatigue what happens is that people who had been through any traumatic traumatic event and you are there helping them out. As a result of it, the physical complaints, the psychological stress and trauma that you're experiencing, that is what happens in compassion fatigue. 
whereas in burnout anyone who whether this person uh, is a healthcare worker or not as a result of work overload as a result of external um, factors um, which affect your performance which affect your physical uh, well-being or psychological well-being that's what burnout is right so it does not necessarily mean that i have to have any sort of interaction in case of burnout uh, with a person who had been through any traumatic event but whereas in case of compassion fatigue you had been dealing with such kinds of cases so that mm. is generally defined the two terms thank you so much for that i think um you know our understanding uh is is a little bit clearer on that but i'd like to go over to tuba um who you know i'm hoping that you'll be able to tell us um a few components um about uh the compassion fatigue and also um how does um compassion fatigue manifest itself in in the healthcare workers so um over to you tuba sure so i would just like to add in to what humaira uh, just stated and i would just add that uh, it is a sense of helplessness it is a sense of hopelessness and isolation that one experiences because of prolonged exposure to suffering of another individual um it lead, it leads to being less empathetic of course and this in turn leads to being compassion fatigue so uh, when we talk about the components of compassion fatigue i would like to say that it is a multi component uh, multi component construct it includes burnout like mera just introduced it includes secondary traumatic stress and it includes compassion satisfaction um Humaira just discussed what compassion fatigue is, and she distinguished it with um, burnout. So I would move over to secondary traumatic stress. It is uh, it basically involves the the work related secondary exposure that healthcare professionals are exposed to. Uh, they experience the traumatic events because uh, the, because of the nature of their work. Similarly, compassion satisfaction is the positive feeling that they. periods uh because of their nature of work um this is the satisfaction that they experience this is the the professional nature of their work that helps them mm-hmm. to move on basically mm-hmm. so when we say that a person is uh experiencing compassion fatigue they are basically experiencing high levels of burnout high levels of compassion uh, secondary traumatic stress and low levels of compassion satisfaction Right. Uh, right. These are basically the components of compassion fatigue. Moving on to uh, how compassion fatigue is manifested in individuals, we need to see that it is divided into certain categories. It can be divided into work-related categories. It can be divided into physical symptoms. It can be divided into emotional symptoms and some mm-hmm. other categories as well. Um, when we talk about work-related symptoms, it is important that we see that uh, the individual who is experiencing compassion fatigue avoids and dreads going to work. They mm-hmm. use frequent sick days. They would avoid certain patients, particularly because of their exposure to trauma. Uh, they have mm-hmm. a reduced ability to be empathetic towards them. Mm-hmm. When we talk mm-hmm. about physical symptoms, it includes digestive problems. It includes stomach aches. It includes uh, sleep disturbances, particularly insomnia or hypersomnia, be it anything. Uh, mm-hmm. It includes cardiac symptoms, um, which can be, uh, which can be palpitations, which could be chest pain. Uh, it includes headache and muscle tension and fatigue. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, sorry too, but um, your um, in your line of work, I know you've got a, quite a few that you're going to cover now. Do you have individuals who come to you and actually describing some of these, um, you know, symptoms, if I can call them? Um, and you know, how do you actually diagnose it is compassion fatigue? So, um, so you see, the emotional symptoms and the physical symptoms are really comorbid with any with any other disorders as well. Be it PTSD, be it depression, be it anxiety. So we need to rule out certain things first. We need to really uh, take a deep uh, case history, and for uh, to diagnose compassion fatigue, we need we use the scale professional quality of life scale, which was developed uh, um, some ten years ago, and it has many versions updated over the period of time. so we give those tests to the individual and even after that we put in more emphasis on the case history their working history uh, particularly to diagnose them with compassion fatigue mm mm-hmm. um humaira um i mean 
can you add on to something? I mean, I know yeah. um, Tuba mentioned that, you know, individuals can come with these kinds of symptoms. Um, yeah. I mean, today, you know, um, you wanted to look into the healthcare, you yeah. know, um, whether it's, you know, in the UK or Pakistan or America, you know, at the end of the day, there's something that these workers are going through where yeah. you mentioned the word burnout. Yeah. Um, you know, um, how are they overlooking in not recognizing this? All right. Okay, so continuing with what just to, uh, to explain in detail, let me yeah. um, let me give you an example of situations which will clarify the audience even more. So um, this recent pandemic, this whole COVID-19, our healthcare workers across the world, they were actually working really hard to provide, you know, quality care services to all mm -hmm. the people. Um, you know, the, uh, those people who were suffering with COVID, whether uh, they belong, uh, you know, they were living in the third world country or they were living in the developed country, it was a catastrophe, it was a global emergency. Now, mm -hmm. in all this situation, something which was actually relatively new for all the healthcare workers, they were all very enthusiastic uh, to provide the best of best services and healthcare facilities to all of these people. But as Tuba mentioned, what happens is that all these things slowly, gradually, they start affecting you. Now, the person who walks into your hospital or your clinic, of course, he's traumatized, he's, he's scared, he's suffering physically as well as psychologically. So as a result of it, now, if I'm a nurse or if I'm a doctor, I am enthusiastic, I'm providing you the best of my services. But when I'm dealing with so many patients at one given time who are suffering in one or the other way with the same disorder, it will lead to irritability it will lead to what we call as frustration it will mm. lead to you know um, i will feel i just feel like giving up because it's it, it's becoming too much for now to handle so many people at one given time so mm. when we say uh, that it is compassion fatigue so the person who is coming to me i have to comfort him i have to be compassionate i have to yes. have my responsibility as compared to people who are working in other different profession my responsibility is different and perhaps double in a sense that it is not just handling the patient or interacting with people. Um, I have to comfort the person who is traumatized, who is scared, who is physically, psychologically uh, too scared and affected and damaged and suffering. Mm. So, mm. however, whereas in burnout, uh, just as again Tuba mentioned, that these two things that they may coexist. But let's suppose, for example, I am working uh, in a multinational company. I am not working or interacting with someone who is traumatized but mm. there is workload right there are many mm. other external factors and i feel that all of these things are affecting the my professional quality of life i feel that i um, you know i cannot um, render my services just as i used to so that mm. is what usually happens in case of burnout in case of compassion fatigue the recent example of this global emergency of this pandemic yes one of yes. the example and uh, mm. i must say that nurses doctors all those people mm who were uh, working as healthcare workers, as frontline mm. workers, they literally tried their level best and they are still doing in the provision mm. of facilities mm. to people. And as a result I mean, of it, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, uh, right yeah. what it what it sounds like is if we don't look after ourselves, especially okay. if we're in that caring profession, how do we take care of those who need our attention? True, um, true. You know, and I, I can also relate that to teaching staff, you know, um, at the end of the day, um, you know, uh, this emotional, physical, mental exhaustion that, you know, mm -hmm. both of you have briefly described. You know, um, all of this sounds like it's in relation to, you know, all of these professions, you know, mm -hmm. um, but uh, more so if it's in the care industry, mm -hmm. then, um, you know, these patients who need that, you know, uh, very, very important, significant attention, we yeah. may not be able to give that. And yeah. if we don't, then, you know, um, if it goes to extreme, th there could be dangers, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um Coming on to the, um, the this compassion fatigue, maybe Tuba can mention to us what could be the worst situation, you know, or what could be much more worse, um, or what can make compassion um, uh, fatigue more worse. Um, if you can tell us a bit about that, um, Tuba. So, what can make compassion fatigue worse is that you're suffering alone. 
the thing is that you need to reach out to people you need to reach out and to ask for help but if you're suffering alone uh, this can worsen your situation it is you know it's about your thoughts it's about your perception so when you deal with people and you think that you know the other person is uh, is being uh, more rude to me because um, it, the, the compassion fatigue is really really related with thoughts now nah? so uh, you need to reach out more and uh, it's about that you talk to someone you seek help be it uh, from a professional or you reach out for help within your uh, within the people in your same field uh, we can schedule some activities as well you need to express yourself that is most important right right and uh, humaira um can you um say something about what can um, departments, um, whether it's the government or um, any other, um, you know, the higher, um, you know, positioned people, how can they, you know, help or play a part towards combating um, mm. such uh, compassion fatigue in, you know, these healthcare professionals? Yeah, so basically, um, when we talk about compassion fatigue, as I've mentioned already, that, okay, so it is acute, it happens suddenly, whereas in burnout, it gradually develops. It develops over time, right? Um, now, people who are working in a healthcare facility or in the department, what happens is they want someone to understand their pain. They want someone to comfort them and to support them in the best way possible. So uh, whether at government level or at private level, we need to assure them the best facilities to our healthcare workers. Uh, we need to assure them that, yes, of course, they will not only be getting a good salary, but also in case they need proper professional help, they will get a chance to uh, uh, avail that service as well. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, I, I, get, I got a chance uh, to you know, speak to a couple of healthcare professionals, um, and I was really happy and surprised to know that uh, when uh, they were working during this whole pandemic, their supervisor, their managers were kind enough to allow them to take a week or two weeks off so they can go out, they can spend time. Brilliant. With them. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. here in Pakistan, there are some really, really good, you know, private as well as mm -hmm. government organizations who are quite considerate and they do understand mm -hmm. the compassion fatigue, of course, they, you know, it may take yeah. a toll. The best part about compassion fatigue is it is treatable. It, yeah. Well, like it sounds it's, like, you know, training um, is needed for something like this, yes. you know, and, you know, um, is it being recognized, you know, that um, this is, you know, what's happening and, you know, this is what needs uh, some attention to be addressed? Okay, so basically there are people who do have specialization actually in mm -hmm. working with people, uh, you know, uh, who have who experience compassion fatigue. So they do work with such people, helping them, uh, training them that how they can overcome it. So when we talk about compassion fatigue, that how we can help such people, the best thing that we can do is, is to psychoeducate people about it. Mm. That yes, it is something which is acute. It is something we do understand that it affects you on so many levels, just as uh, Tuba mentioned that it affects you, the quality of your work, yeah. the, your personal life, your physical well-being, your psychological well-being. And of course, mm. all of these things will have an impact on all those people who are connected to you in one or the other way. Um, yeah. So a good organization, uh, who do understand what can be the repercussions of it will definitely understand and they do understand. Um, yeah. Like I said that uh, there are some really, really good organizations and hospitals which are currently working and operating here in Pakistan sure. in different cities. They do that. Yeah, they do. Yeah. 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 So, um, I mean, um, I'd like to ask too, but I mean, in the profession that you're in, it's, it's a very important role where you have to play, you know, uh, and it matters to individuals' lives. Have you ever found yourself in situations where you've actually had this compassion fatigue? And if you did, how did you go about it yourself? Yes, it's very common in our profession as well, because you see, when we deal with patients, we do not really know what initial complaint they, the, the, the initial complaint they come with is very different to what they actually experiencing the real thing that is actually creating problem is undiscovered after a number of sessions so sometimes mm. someone might come with a complaint of having low moods or you know lo loss uh, uh, loss of sleep and um, uh, reduced appetite but actually uh, what they actually experienced is uh, that they were sexually abused perhaps a few years ago so mm. when we when we have to uncover certain stories like that that really, mm. that really does affect us so, mm. um, of course, we need to um, 
to go over how we perceive their stories, what thoughts come in our mind, how can we deal with our own transferences and counter transferences that uh, we have with our uh, clients. And of course, we need supervision for that. So uh, it's really, really important that we take care for ourselves. We need to mm. cater to what we think about their situation. Uh, you know, the, the sexual abuse survivors are just only one uh, scenario. Uh, we deal with domestic violence cases. We deal with uh, patients. Uh, we deal with clients who are abused by their fathers. They were abused by mm. their husbands. So yes, um, we are also at risk of experiencing uh, compassion fatigue and it is very mm. important for us to keep our thoughts in check mm. it's like you're reliving this psychological or physiological yeah. you know yes. uh, effects that are happening with people but yeah. you know you've got to take it on yourself to be able to say right okay they've come to me for that um comfort Am I in a position, you know, am I, um, you know, out of this compassion fatigue to be able to give them some steps to, to say, right, okay, you know, this is what you need to do. Um, yeah. So on that note, um, Humaira, um, we've mentioned some uh, aspects of how to overcome uh, this compassion fatigue, you know, what suggestions would you give to not only to, um, you know, uh, where you are in Pakistan, but, you know, countries, you know, such as UK, where I am from, I know, you know, uh, I mean, I know only too well what teachers and what um, other, um, you know, health professionals in this country, in UK, are going through. And it sounds like there is a lot of this emotional, physical exhaustion that's happening. Of course, of course. Um, you know, and we wonder whether, you know, uh, the government is uh, putting something in place to help with support and training and, you know, whether it's the schools or, or one of the NHS um, hospitals, you know, mm -hmm. have they got something in place? So mm -hmm. what kind of things could you suggest that um, they look into, you know, to help in aid? Um, yeah. you know, with combating um, compassion fatigue. All right. So as I mentioned um, you know, previously, that when we talk about compassion fatigue, so it's not only doctors and nurses, but anyone who is associated with the healthcare industry may experience symptoms um, of health, uh, of compassion fatigue. Now, Atuba has mentioned and she spoke about uh, supervision. It's actually imperative that clinical psychologists, let's start first with clinical psychologists, like I myself, I'm a clinical psychologist. There are people who are working as psychiatrists. So when you are dealing with people who have been through any kind of traumatic event, like the ones that Tuba mentioned, it's mm. important to go for supervision. Uh, people, mm. um, you know, when I'm talking about supervision, of course, there are PhDs, people who, who have completed their postdocs. You can, of course, share with them. They can guide you that how you can work on a case like this one. And at the on the same hand, how you can take care of yourself along with it. So that's mm. one way of handling compassion fatigue. Second important thing is that understand, accept that all of these things, of course, they are a part and parcel of the job that you are doing. So uh, pay attention to your job. Do not uh, invest so much time that it starts taking a toll. So I remember one of my teachers, she mentioned one thing that when we talk about empathy, we generally mm. say that empathy means putting yourself you know, or placing yourself in someone else's shoe. But mm. do not forget that it is not your pair of shoe, you know. Mm. So mm. do understand that you have your share of struggles as well. Um, so be mindful of that as well. When you start seeing that these are the things, these are the physical symptoms, psychological mm. symptoms that are affecting the overall job efficiency, work efficiency, go to mm. the relevant people and ask for help. Third mm. important thing that we can, of course, do at institutional level, at um, individual level at community level is to you know um, to provide a good support system to people so that they mm. can come and they know that they can confide in you 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 will be there you will be supporting them because of mm. course like it's it's actually quite challenging it's not that easy people mm. they are away from their loved ones they are there for you they're comforting you so it's, it's a lot of effort which they are putting yeah. so um, mm. The support that you provide, of course, is something uh, which will help people in coming out from this compassion fatigue. Um, sure. Spending time with yourself, practicing mindfulness is something which I personally mm. do as well. And of course, I suggest to my client as well, whether they are from healthcare industry or not, but mindfulness 
practicing yoga, meditation are some of the mm. things which will help you in keeping a check on your thoughts and, you know, um, coming out from all of these things which you are experiencing. So these are mm -hmm. some of the things that people, whether they are living in the UK or Pakistan, um, yeah. prioritizing yeah. things, journaling, scheduling, these are some of the things which can perhaps help you um, in so many ways. Brilliant, yes. Anything you'd like to add on to that, Tuba? <laughs> I would just like to add that that journaling is equally as important as cathartic experiences. <clears throat> Sorry. And expressing yourself through art is actually very helpful because um, that is a very safe medium. You know, your you, whatever you're experiencing, you just draw it out. Or you just, you know, paint it out. It is very safe because you don't have to be very... Um, elaborate in telling what you are uh, what you are experiencing it is the therapist's job to actually understand and then to probe whatever you are experiencing through arts and expressive arts techniques mm -hmm. moreover mm -hmm. exercising and deep breathing just like humera mentioned and scheduling me time is as important as well mm -hmm. it could be mm -hmm. as simple as enjoying a cup of coffee it could be as simple as reading your favorite <laughs> book or moving out going somewhere enjoying a, a chilly air it could be anything simple, but it's just that that you validate what you're feeling, that you uh, mm -hmm. that you let yourself experience whatever you are, uh, whatever you're dealing with, and then you move on from that. That is what's mm -hmm. important. Yeah. It is equally helpful uh, uh, when you're talking to someone else, like Madam. Mm, brilliant. I mean, if I may share with you, ladies, um, it was only yesterday um, I went to have cupping um, and hijama done I, I think if, if you're familiar with that yeah yeah um, it was the first time I was petrified um, I mean um, half of my family had it done but it yeah. what I must say is I think what what that has um, I mean the reason I, I want to share this is because I feel it has it does sort of like the experience is it takes away some of the stresses and anxieties and it just relaxes you and just you know gives you a feel good factor afterwards you know um and you know uh, for the mental you know and emotional well-being and the physical side of it so i don't know if i could add that onto your list of you know how to look after yourself um yeah. you know that you know i mean from my own experience i just feel you know, wow, you know, I'm a new woman today, you know, um, but it's a positive thing. And, you know, your body actually feels it like, okay, I, I think I can now um, perform better in whatever I do, you know, um, and I can face, um, you know, the hard world out there a little bit better than I would have normally. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I just thought I'll... That, yeah, adding on to that, I personally believe that taking care of yourself um, you're taking some me time out, going to a spa, going and spending time with your friends are something that we should generally encourage, actually. Um, we, normal, you know, normal circumstances, <laughs> we would, Humaira. Uh, uh, it's yeah. only because the of lockdown course, yeah. is here nationally. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but maybe, I mean, that's not stopping us from going on Zoom and, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah. You know? um, but yeah, um, and also as Tuba mentioned, you know, um, you know, sometimes, you know, um, doing something you enjoy and, you know, yeah. for yourself, something for yourself, you know, so to take yeah. care of that. Yeah. Um, but the and accordingly, you know, finding out that what can be the most appropriate and best way of spending time with yourself. Because um, mm. I think that if I will take care of myself, only then yes. I would be able to take care of my patients and people who are connected to me and with me, you know. Yeah. I will yeah. I have connected really with or not. Hmm. Yes, and it doesn't really have to be all elaborate, you know, it could be as hmm. simple as anything. It could just yes. be, you know, spending time yourself, enjoying a simple cup of coffee could be uh, you know, living as well as time. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I, I'm a little bit sore today, but, you know, it was only yesterday I had this cupping done. Um, but, yeah. um, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, I mean, we were told that, you know, you have to give 24 hours before you can have any dairy products just so, yeah. you know, you heal quick. <laughs> so I can't even enjoy yeah. a nice cup of tea today. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I suppose it's for in the... Oh, I need my cup of tea, you know, um, first thing in the morning. <laughs> uh, but it's like, um, you know, I had to have black tea, which is all right, you know, but, you know, uh, it's yeah. one of those things you think, oh, I, I want to relax. But, you know, I've had this cupping done and it's for me, you know, to, yeah. to uh, make myself feel better and, you know, uh, 
you know, be ready for that harsh world out there that we have, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. But um, yes, so um, anything else you ladies would like to add on? Um, we are um, almost coming to the end of our show. Um, and if we can wrap up. Yeah, so just to add, uh, let me just add a couple of things. Uh, compassion fatigue is very much real. And however, the good part is it is uh, treatable. Um, mm -hmm. You can always uh, ask for people who are there, your loved ones, your colleagues to give you the kind of support because of course, um, if you're investing so much time and energy um, in taking care of people who had been through so much, and which is why this is what is why it is trauma. Because somebody mm. has been through that trauma, but you are indirectly getting affected. Um, but the best part is, like I said, it, that it is treatable. So do not ignore yourself. Whatever works best for you in the given situation and circumstances, the place, the country, the city where you're living, try mm. to accept it. Uh, there is uh, nothing bad about compassion fatigue as long mm. as you are attending it taking care of it, trying to work on it, that's more important. Of course, you cannot be always uh, compassionate and empathetic. We all go through the days. Sometimes, you know, when we're too tired, we, we really cannot focus. We do experience these things. But as long as we're taking care of it, that's more important. Mm, definitely. Thank you so much for that. And thank you very much, ladies, for joining me today um, to cover some of the important aspects about um, compassion fatigue and in, you know, uh, specifically for, you know, people who are in the healthcare, whether they're doctors, nurses, whether they're, you know, they're clinical psychologists, you know, whether, you know, you are a counsellor, you know, or even in places like teaching professions um, mm. and, you know, other organizations. So what we have learned is, you know, we have to better look after ourselves to be able to, um, you know, go and do our best in, in, in our professions. So thank yeah. you again for joining my show. And, you know, you I do hope that I'll see you again soon uh, on another important topic. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for having us on the show. Well, um, there are... I mean, are you suffering from compassion fatigue um, and is it happening to you? Um, some of the ways to prevent that, you know, practice self-care, um, set yourself emotional boundaries and engage in some outside hobbies. I mean, especially in the UK at the moment with our national lockdown, you know, whatever is safe to do so. Cultivate healthy friendships outside of your work. Keep a journal, boost your resiliency and use some positive coping strategies. I would also suggest that you plan ahead um, with, you know, especially if you're in a, a professional healthcare um, setting and set yourself some boundaries and strategies beforehand. So you know, when you are going out there to comfort someone um, without sacrificing your own emotional well-being. Take advantage of the employer's um, support or sponsored assistance that there may be or any, any assistant programs that they may have, or training that they may have, and create a balance in your life. Surround yourself with positive people. On that note, stay safe and follow Vod Talk. <laughs>